pretty thinking ahead, and it has to do with our flooding and the scenes afterwards. So I'm anxious to look at it. Okay, Julie, your turn. Justice, 
the last great train heist in American history, and how it influenced the rise of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. And of course, on the left there, you see uh, Alvin Karpis, his mugshot at Alcatraz. And then on uh, the right here, of course, is J. Edgar Hoover. This was a photograph put on the cover of Time Magazine years later. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, courtesy of the James A. Garfield Historical Society, this is what our depot looked like in the 1930s. And so I think that is a terrific depiction of uh, kind of trying to visualize what went down. Next slide, please. This is the opposite side of the road and the opposite shot of the depot. And obviously, by looking at the car, you can tell it's years after the 1930s. Next. And here is a, a photograph of the Erie train coming in from Cleveland to the Garrisville Depot. Next. And uh, it's going to minimize this for me. But this was actually the uh, front page news, the plane dealer, November 8, 1935. And if you could click there on the far uh, left hand side, there's the first photograph. First picture down. Move it up just a little. There we go. Okay, as you can see on the far left is Mr. Earl Davis, who had to carry the four pouches from the station platform to the getaway car. Uh, Mrs. W.L. Scott was actually mailing a letter to her husband who was away on a hunting trip when she had the muzzle of a gun shoved in her back. And uh, I think some of these families are still in the area. Mr. Robert Rocket, and then below are the, um, the train engineer and the, the firemen who were also taken at gunpoint. So this is actually a very good depiction of what went down. <coughs> On the first sultry day of May, 1936, bound by only an agent's yellow tie. Bank robber, suspected murder, kidnapper, gangster of the 1930s, and of course, the last public enemy number one of the Depression era, Alvin Creepy Carpus stated with self assurance I made Hoover's reputation as a fearless lawman. It's a reputation he doesn't deserve. I made that son of a bitch. For the residents of Garrettsville, this quote has special interest. We're a town of less than 2,500 people. In the Plain Dealer, in an interview, a young man in his 20s stated, quote, One day I told some of my friends I'd like to be in one of those robberies just to see how it felt. But believe me, I've had enough. I can still feel that machine gun in my back. End quote. On November 7th, 1935, this young man, Earl Davis, a news agent from Garrettsville, was at the, uh, the train depot to pick up the afternoon edition of the Cleveland Press. And uh, he knew that the mail train was coming in from uh, Cleveland. And unfortunately, he became an involuntary aide to the five bandits led by Alvin Creepy Carpus, who held up Erie Train 626 and escaped with $34,000 in cash and $12,450 in securities. Now today, how much money do you think that represents? Any guesses? Close. $715,000. And mind you, that was during uh, the end of the Great Depression when people were struggling for money. So magnify that even yet. One shot was fired off to scare the bystanders. And unfortunately, Orlin Workman, who was a mail clerk, was graced. He was the only injury. He was graced by that stray bullet. Now this was, carried, this was carried out in American Wild West fashion. The bandits, they led a line of about 12 men and women on the station's platform. They made them line up and raised their hands 
for what seemed like an hour. And Earl Davis, who got so tired from holding his hands up, finally folded them in front of him. And just as he had done that, he felt the muscle go into his back, and he was forced by gunpoint to carry four pouches from the station's platform to the Plymouth sedan, which was the getaway car. Now, mind you, this was the first train robbery in Ohio in 25 years. Amazing. Consequently, it took the thorough investigation work of the United States Postal Inspectors out of Youngstown to connect the train robbery to Alvin Carpus and his gang. And the FBI had been looking for them since June of 1933. Mind you, he was caught May 1st, 1936. So essentially, this train heist and last criminal act by Carpus prompted the FBI's director, J. Edgar Hoover, and his G-men to stand up and take notice. Inevitably, the slow but sure power of the FBI secured Carpus's arrest, and it also got something for J. Edgar Hoover. It was his first arrest. Slow. Okay, here we see once the train reached its, reached its destination in Pittsburgh, they, um, they show here the um, detectives looking for bullet holes because as I had mentioned, they did fire off one shot. Although I've also read in newspapers where they filed, uh, fired off several shots. So uh, we're not 100% certain how many shots were fired off, but they're looking to try and count and see how many were. Now the question remains, what do I do with this information now that I know it? I originally had uh, decided that I was going to do my senior capstone on whether or not our country was founded on Christian principles. And since it had been investigated and researched so much, my heart really wasn't in it. Mm -hmm. And so one night I decided that I wanted to rent the movie J. Edgar. It was a film directed by Clint Eastwood, and it's a biographical film of J. Edgar Hoover. It stars Leonardo DiCaprio, and I was watching it. There was a scene where Machine Gun Kelly, who was a well-known bank robber, also a kidnapper, he, um, he was caught in his apartment in the middle of the night, unarmed, scared to death by FBI agents. And so they showed a scene shortly after with G-men written all over the walls. And I, I was like, what is, what is the mascot of my alma mater doing written all over the outside of those walls? So I began thinking, of course, that, hey, there's a story to be told here. And it appears to me a pretty big story. So this led me to my thesis. I started my investigation. And I drafted what I um, held to be the point of what I was going to research. And it just reads as such. This local to national approach adds to what we know about the struggles of Hoover and the FBI as the front runner in federal law enforcement. My research presents this local crime, culminating in my hometown in northeastern Ohio, as the catalyst for pressuring the FBI to transition from its conventional methods of gathering, analyzing, and disseminating intelligence into developing increasingly sophisticated non-science non -science techniques. These modifications concentrate on human source intelligence, such as confidential informants and interviews with suspects and witnesses, surveillance, covert means with agents going undercover. And as a result of these advancements, Carpus was exposed and Hoover was able to secure his first arrest. This began the rise of J. Edgar Hoover and his agents, leading the FBI to become the elite federal power in the struggle for law and order. Now, my big question was, how did the last successful train heist in American history and the arrest of uh, gangster Alvin Creepy Carpus cement the reputation of the FBI's J. Edgar Hoover? To answer this question, I began my research with the local uh, archives, of course, starting with Kit at the Historical Society, went to the Western Reserve Historical Society, ended up in Washington, D.C., 
And uh, as you can imagine, this was a very exhausting research. And so uh, just to give you an idea, this is kind of a funny story. I, uh, I was staying up a lot of nights. Some nights I was up all night, continuously. And um, I, I remember one night I went to bed and uh, I had a dream that uh, I was Elvin Carpus. And I was at the Middlefield Bank in Garrettsville. And I was robbing it. And not only that, guess who my accomplice was? You'll never guess. J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> and you can imagine that didn't end well, which it didn't. And so. But lo and behold, it gives you an idea of how your mind can wander and how you can really get wrapped up in what's going on in, in something that you're researching. So, um, so yeah, I continued to the hunt for what I thought I was looking for. And so I went from local to uh, a little further local, and that meant the collections at Kent State University, University of Akron, Cleveland State, and the Ohio State University. I also, as I mentioned, made it to Washington. I visited the Library of Congress. That's where I got much of my information about J. Edgar Hoover. The Department of Justice, the United States Postal Inspection Service, the National Archives in Washington, D.C., Kansas City, and College Park, Maryland. I also was able to locate records from the Minnesota Historical Society, and I found a huge file there put together by a journalist and historian named Paul Maccabee. He was actually a resident, a lifetime resident of St. Paul, and uh, he was doing a non-fiction history book, which inevitably became Dillinger Slept Here, with the information that he had gathered. And he had looked at all of the Midwest gangsters in the 1930s. So I found some invaluable stuff in, in his collection. I also, and you can see much of that back here, I also found the criminal case files on Alvin Carpus um, from San Bruno in California. Uh, as, you, as I mentioned, he spent 25, almost 26 years at Alcatraz and set a record. Nobody ever spent that much time there. And so I have all of those records. I also did quite a few in-depth interviews. One of the first ones that I did, and just uh, coincidentally by luck, was I located a retired FBI agent who had worked underneath J. Edgar Hoover from the late 60s until 1972 when he had passed. And uh, he told me all about the supposed <coughs> official first arrest and what his experiences were, what J. Edgar Hoover told him, and so we'll get to that a little bit later. But he was very instrumental in, in kind of pointing me the right directions. Um, also, I interviewed a lot of longtime residents here in Garrettsville. Uh, Dr. James Pezicek, who's an alum from the 1950s, he told me he remembered, uh, as well as many others, that uh, the mascot was formulated because of the government, men that flooded the town after the robbery. And uh, I also talked to William House, who's another 1950s alum, who actually designed the mascot. And I also talked to, um, I talked to Richard Davis. And I'm not sure, is Richard here tonight, kids? No? no <coughs> Richard is actually the son of Earl Davis, and he discussed with me what his dad told him after the robbery. Though he was a young boy, um, he had a lot of, of great information. So um, just a tremendous amount of stuff I could go on and on, but this has been researched heavily. Now, as far as what other historians have said, a lot of the books you read will tell you, for example, Kirk Gentry, who is um, J. Edgar Hoover's biographer, or was, he, um, he really wrote kind of a negative thing about Hoover. He said that he's, he's, he's a swivel chair detective, and he paints a, the FBI in a bad light. And I was just very surprised by this, and I, I ran across this quite a bit. Just as important, um, I realized that no one had, had investigated this particular crime on a very intimate level and how a local historical topic had national implications. Nobody had done that with this topic. And so that's what I set out to do. Now, just to tell you a little bit more than what you had seen in the first documentary uh, information on Carpus, he was born Alvin, A-L-B-I-N, Alvin Francis Carpowitz. It's 
spelled K-A-R-O-P-I-C-Z. Now, he, um, his parents were actually Lithuanian immigrants. He was born in Montreal, Canada in 1908. And when he was about six years old, his parents moved to Topeka, Kansas. And uh, it was his elementary school teacher, of all people, who uh, said, well, it's a little bit easier to manage if we call you Alvin Carpus. So that's how his name came to be. His parents' old farmhouse actually butted up against a, a railroad, and that was great for Carpus because he was fascinated by trains. Trains could take him anywhere he wanted to go. But there was a downside. The train tracks also were a safe haven for prostitutes, pimps, and petty things. And when he got around them, he really liked the action. It's one of those nurture versus nature debates. You know, was it innate or did he develop it? I think he kind of developed it. So um, he started running errands for them. And uh, by the time he was 10, he had stolen his first gun. And so, as I mentioned, he's fascinated by trains was kind of introducing himself to a life of crime. And in 1925, at age 17, he was caught riding the roof of the Pan American Express into Florida, and he received 30 days of hard labor. Now, interesting enough, he never held, his, in his entire lifetime, a viable job. He worked for a baker for a few months. Uh, he also uh, worked for a chemical manufacturer, for actually a little over a year, and he ran errands for them. And amazingly, this is kind of ironic, uh, he was having some kind of health issues. He never said in his book exactly what they were. But the doctor said, well, you've got a heart condition. You need to cut back on the hours you're working and do work that's less strenuous. So he said, oh, OK, I like the crime. That's easy. So after about a year of, um, of uh, getting into trouble and trying to maintain some um, in some type of life outside of crime, um, he, uh, he got in trouble again. And this time, he burglarized a, um, a company, uh, a tire company, stole the tires. He was caught. Uh, the judge, guess how much the judge gave him? Anybody, take a guess. Two days. Five to ten years, leaning towards ten years for stealing tires. And so this, uh, this was not good for Alvin. He ended up going to the Kansas State Reformatory. Uh, that was in Hutchinson. And there he met a very fine character named Larry Duvall. Now, Larry was an expert safe blower and bank robber. And here's where Carpus really got into his criminal education. Um, they become fast friends and uh, decide, hey, we need to break out of this place. So in 1929, they worked in the garage at the um, reformatory, and uh, they had access to bar cutters. And so one night, they got the bar cutters out of the garage, and they cut their way out to freedom. And so for an entire year, they went on a crime spree all the way across Oklahoma. It was amazing. He talked, but they got jewelry, they got brand new clothes, for the inmates and mailed it to them. They got new cars. They got new cars. I mean, it was just amazing. They were having a good old time it's until they decided they wanted to go from Oklahoma because Larry Duvall was creating a lot of heat um, in Oklahoma before he was incarcerated. And so, of course, they knew he had broken out by then, so they were looking for him in Oklahoma. So they said, well, we need to go to Missouri. So we're going to go to Missouri. Um, inevitably, they headed towards Kansas City, and for some odd reason, the state police pulled them over and beat the living tar out of them, and then put them back in the reformatory. So this time, Carpus played it a little bit smart. He was told that if you go from the reformatory to the state penitentiary, which is in Lansing, that you can actually work in the coal mines and knock some of your time off. And so that's what he did. He had only served about three years, and so he could have anywhere from two years to seven more years. And so he figured, I'll try this and see if it works. So he went in, he worked like a dog, and he spent 180 days. And he left a free man. 
a free man after 180 days. Amazing. Okay, next picture. Uh, this is a picture of Alvin Carpus when he was booked at St. Paul uh, for the two kidnappings, major kidnappings. Next. Uh, this is uh, Freddie Barker. Um, he was actually a, uh, became a very close friend of uh, Alvin Carpus's as well. So as far as Freddie Barker is concerned, um, I'm sure most of you have heard of the Ma Barker gang at some point in time. Um, it was her son that uh, <coughs> created a lot of havoc in the Midwest. And so when Carpus had been sent to the state penitentiary in Kansas, that's where he met the, this fine gentleman, Freddie Barker, and Freddie kind of fulfilled the rest of that criminal education I was talking about. And so, again, they became fast friends, and um, I know that uh, Carpus often described him in his autobiography, Freddie, as a very um, malicious individual who didn't hesitate to kill a cop. Um, he really described him as a natural-born killer. And so uh, we see that indicated throughout, throughout the uh, evidence. So once they both got out of jail, they were both in the Kansas State Penitentiary, they got out of jail, they formed an alliance, an alliance which became known as the Carpus Barker Gang. And so on to the next one. Okay. Now, well, uh, they entertained Oklahoma a little bit, conducting a few robberies here and there. Again, it got a little too hot for Freddie because he had already exhausted himself in that state. Cops were looking for him. So uh, they decided that uh, they were going to go to Missouri. And so they rented a farmhouse in Thayer, Missouri. And Freddie, Alvin, and Ma Barker all, all stayed there. And they had another gang member by the name of Bill Weaver who lived in the vicinity of, of where their house was. And so one day, um, Bill came over and he had an old jalopy of a car. And, he said, um, you know, uh, we want to go into town, Alvin, uh, Freddie and I, and check out what's out here, see what the next big score's going to be. And so uh, Alvin's like, okay, you know, I guess you can borrow my car. And so, uh, big mistake. And so what happened was, uh, Freddie and Bill went out to look at what might be available as far as uh, robberies. And unfortunately, they, um, they uh, pulled two flat tires. And so they went to the West Plains garage, and while they were waiting, an older sheriff, a well-known sheriff, who was a sharpshooter and also um, a, a very notorious for gang busting, he approached them and started asking them questions. You know, where are you from? He shoots point blank the sheriff. The sheriff turns around, and he's such a tough old buzzer that he gets his pistol out, and he tries to return fire, but before he can get that trigger down, Bill Weaver shoots him. Later said, uh, quote, the hell of it was that there was a bank across the street, and everybody in the whole town thought we were sweeping it up. They came running down the street with their rifles and started firing. Um, Freddie and, and Bill obviously got away, and unfortunately their car was shot, and they ditched it, so they ran on foot to Bill's house, got his old jalopy, went to uh, Carpus's place, and said, We got to get out of here. We just killed the sheriff. So lo and behold, they had to leave another state. Um, and so throughout, throughout history, or during the time that Carpus was alive, um, he was marked as the killer, as you can see here, along with Freddie Barker, of uh, the Missouri Sheriff, because the plates were uh, licensed under him. And so uh, they decided, well, things didn't work out there either, so we're going to go to St. Paul. St. Paul is a great place to go. So late in 1932, Carpus and Freddie pulled off a, uh, a flawless bank job in Minneapolis, they didn't fire a shot, and they got $7,000. The next job generated $22,000. Their biggest bank score also took place in Minneapolis at the Northwestern National Bank, and you'll never guess how much they got out of that bank. $266,000 in 1932. So they were, they were pretty happy. They were real happy. Now we got all this money. So, uh, mind you, the Carpus gang, they were smart. And I'll tell you why they were smart. They planned 
Every detail, they weren't your typical desperado. They planned every detail of every bank robbery. For example, they would track the mileage exactly from the job to their destination. They'd canvass all the back roads numerous times so they knew it like the back of their hand. They provided a hidden gasoline cache um, every few miles so if their gas tank got shot out by a vigilante or a cop, they could refuel. And not only that, they brought corks along so if their gas tank got shot, they could stick a cork in it. Not only that, they would make sure there's always young girls coming in and out of a bank or serving as a bank teller, and they would, uh, they would kidnap two girls out of every bank job, hoist them up on the sides of the running boards, and take off like crazy with them on. And so that way, that would ensure that the cops wouldn't shoot them. So it's pretty ingenious. Uh, they never uh, kept their cars. They'd always exchange cars, get out of one car, get into another. It's probably why they're running out of money all the time. Um, and so another tactic that they liked to use was drop tax. I'm sure you've seen it in movies. They drop tax off the back of their car and the cops run over them and flatten their tires. So um, it was just amazing the amount of thought that these, um, these desperados put into robbing banks and why they were successful for so long. So, but eventually, after bank after bank, the banks started getting smarter. And the cops started getting smarter. Instead of going in the, chasing them in the front door, they thought, oh, maybe we ought to check the back door. That's probably where they're going. So, after a while, it got very difficult to try and get out of these uh, bank jobs alive. And so, uh, next, so they needed to find a little bit simpler life. In the meantime, J. Edgar Hoover, um, was rising in the ranks. By 1924, William Burns became entangled in the Warren G. Harding administration. It was very scandalous and, and was fired as the director of the Bureau. And that's when Hoover assumed its permanent director. Putting his cataloging experience from the Library of Congress to good use, he reorganized the Justice Department's record keeping procedures and he designed a cross-reference filing system that allowed the Bureau's agents to trace a fingerprint or a physical description back to a specific <coughs> criminal. With the rise in criminal activity during the 30s, Hoover also established a technical laboratory. That was done in fall of 1932. And by late 1932, this data also became accessible to the local police departments. Now remember, the Bureau had no guns at that time. In the early 30s, they didn't have guns. Therefore, uh, Hoover had to solely rely on his ingeniousness, on his intelligence, and on secret intelligence. And so with the support of uh, FDR in Congress, um, U.S. Attorney General Homer Cummings initiated the May-June 1934 crime bills, and this in turn gave the Bureau the power to make arrests and to carry weapons. But Hoover had another weapon. Next. Now, this is, uh, this is um, a guy holding, it's a reenactment, so it's not actually an agent, um, holding a Tommy gun. And they were used by both sides. They were used by the cops, and they were used by the gangsters. And so in 1920, they contracted Colt's patent firearms manufacturing to, to produce 15,000 of these firearms, and they were actually, the Thompson submachine gun was named after General Thompson in World <coughs> War I. So after that, it really became a world-recognized symbol of American gangland. Next. Uh, here is uh, compliments of my friend Larry Weck, a retired FBI agent, an example of them uh, shooting some rounds with a Tommy gun. Now this was uh, Hoover's other secret weapon, was the government men. According to Hoover, the nickname G-Men originated during the arrest of George Machine Gun Kelly, who um, on September 26, 1933, I had mentioned previously that uh, the FBI finally caught up with him at his, at his apartment. And so uh, it was in the middle of the night, and uh, he heard them come in. He was in bed. He jumped up, scared to death, unarmed, and he's like, don't shoot, G-Men, don't shoot, G-Men, and the name stuck. So Hoover went with it. So that's, uh, that's how the G-Men came to be. Quite, a, quite a, an easy, uh, simple explanation. 
So now that bank robberies were becoming extremely difficult, they decided, well, they had a friend who actually, uh, his name was Jack Piper, and he was tied to the Minneapolis gambling interests. He was also a bootlegger who provided the speakeasies with booze around St. Paul, and he gave them various jobs, stealing, robbing, whatever, making a cut, whatever they got. And one day, he looked at them, he gathered them together, he said, how would you guys, how would you boys like to do a kid? And they looked at each other, well, what's that? Dangerous? And Jack said, no, no, I have this perfect plan. I have it all planned out. You guys, if you ask $100,000, you can get this guy for sure. And so that's exactly what they did. The, uh, the victim, uh, William Ham, was a prominent brewer in St. Paul. He had stocks, bonds, jewelry, and property. He was also president of the Theodore Ham Brewery. And during this time, June of 1933, Ham was set to become even richer with the Government Act of 1933 thus ending prohibition, allowing breweries to sell beer with some alcohol content. So he was going to be set. So on June 15, 1933, the same day as the Kansas City Massacre, Ham was working in his office. He worked till 6 o'clock. He left. He had the same routine every day. He left his office. He went to the top of the hill where his mansion was, and he ate dinner. And so on his way out of his office building at 6 o'clock, uh, Winchester, one of the gang members, along with Carpus, who was driving the car, and their other fellow um, uh, gang members, decided that uh, they were going to pretend like they're uh, businessmen. So Win Winchester was very distinguished looking, and he was probably in his late 50s, early 60s, very clean cut, and so he was wearing a suit. He approached Mr. Ham. He said, Mr. Ham, I have a business proposition for you. Could you come with me? Mr. Ham thought nothing of it. He went and followed him right to the car, got in the back seat. When he got in the back seat, Winchester said, Mr. Ham, I'm sorry to do this to you. i got to tell you to get down on the floor because we're taking you somewhere and I don't want you to know where you're going. <laughs> and he was, he still couldn't believe what was happening. He didn't know that the Carpus Barker gang members just got a hold of him. And so uh, he was held for five days, model prisoner, uh, got the $100,000. The guys were set. Um, so on to the next thing. But... What they forgot was their fingerprints. When they handled the ransom notes that Ham said to the chief of his bank, they forgot that the FBI had been working on a crime lab, and they were using a new state-of-the-art technology called Latin fingerprint identification, and it raised incriminating fingerprints from surfaces that couldn't be dusted for prints. So Alvin Carpus and Doc Barker, as well as, as Charles Fitzgerald, um, they had not gotten away with this crime. And they left their fingerprints behind on all of the ransom notes. So now they were wanted. January 1934, Edward Bremer. Um, this time, another one of their crooked confidants by the name of Harry Sawyer. Um, he owned a, a restaurant slash cigar shop where all the criminals hung out in St. Paul. It was called the Green Lantern, and every criminal you can imagine, from Lucky Luciano to um, Bugsy Moran to anybody you can think of essentially ended up at this place. And it was a good place to solicit to find people that you wanted to help make the next score with you. So this was a very popular place, and so they trusted Harry's judgment. Harry said, you know, I don't like this, this Edward George Bremer guy. He's just, he's just under my skin, and I think you guys should kidnap him, and, and he should ask for $200,000. And so feeling confident, though they were still being hunted, um, on January 17, 1934, they decided they were going to kidnap this Edward George Bremer. He was the president of the Commercial State Bank in St. State, in State Paul, and so he was a big pain. When they got him, first of all, Edward tried to convince Carpus, hey, you got the wrong man. You need to return him. When that didn't work, he's like, my dad's never going to pay $200,000 for me. And went on and on, and Carpus was like, I'm so glad to get rid of this guy who's driving me nuts. <laughs> Essentially, they got the $200,000, and his father, Adolf Bremer, actually sent a uh, note along with the, uh, the $200,000 and said, I'm sorry, guys, but... 
Here's the ransom, but the bills are all marked by the FBI. So good luck with that, but here's the money. <laughs> so that was kind of after the fact, after they had already uh, returned to uh, Edward George Bremer. So needless to say, they could never spend that $200,000. Next. Okay, as the FBI's newly developed fingerprint file and forensic labs were re catching gangsters off guard, by March 1934, because of the backlash also from the Bremer kidnapping, members of the Carpus Barker gang had fled to Chicago. And it was here in Chicago that Carpus and Freddie decided, oh, we need a little work done. And so they found this underworld Chicago doctor by the name of Joseph Moran. And he did a little cut and snip, and he... Uh, he actually extended carpets in his ear lobes, and if you look closely in any of these pictures, you can see scarves where he, he did the cutting. And not only that, more importantly, Carpus wanted his fingerprints removed. He was like, I'm getting sick of this stuff, J. Edgar Hoover's on my tail, and you know, I need to do something. So he filled his fingertips, all 10 of them, full of cocaine, and started chiseling away the meat from the bone to try and get his fingerprints off. Carpus said it was the most painful thing anybody could ever go through. And so um, so that's what happened. It cost him $750, $500 for the so-called fingerprint removal, and $250 for the earlobe extension. Um, and uh, yeah, so it essentially, uh, Dr. Moran was the gentleman who um, helped launder some of the money through his practice in Chicago, the $200,000. So uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, in the spring of 1934, um, Carpus, Freddie, and Doc really got tired of Chicago. They decided they wanted to go to Ohio. So they went to um, Toledo and then ended up in Cleveland. And there, while there, they made a lot of contacts. They made an awful lot of contacts, a lot of corrupt people in Cleveland and Toledo. Um, Carpus was hired by the Harvard Club in Newburgh Heights. It was a popular gambling hangout for criminals in the Cleveland suburbs. And uh, Carpus really, he really liked uh, Cleveland. He raved about it in his autobiography. He said, uh, Cleveland, like St. Paul, is a really safe city, and it's a good town for criminals because of the crooked cops, the politicians, and the political support for gambling. What better place? And as such, Carpus made friendly contact with a Cleveland private detective named Frank Noonan, and Frank was great friends with the assistant district attorney of uh, the United States, Joe Keenan, so they got a lot of perks there. Next. Okay, during the summer of 1934, uh, while Carpus and the Barkers were in Cleveland, uh, they went to see a movie at a Cleveland theater. It was the night of July 22nd. As I said, 1934. I think they were seeing a movie called Manhattan Melodrama. And uh, they came out and they heard people running around saying, Dillinger's dead, Dillinger's dead. And I was like, oh my God, now they got John. And so this is when officially the FBI or the uh, Bureau still at the time um, classified Alvin Creepy Carpus as a public enemy number one. That great honor was bestowed on him after the death of John Dillinger. And uh, so um, they stayed in Cleveland a little while longer until uh, they all had girlfriends, of course, hung out in prostitution houses most of the time. And so uh, their girlfriends went to a bar one night and uh, got drunk, got into a fight, got arrested. That was really bad because essentially they knew that it was going to come back to them. And so uh, Carpus packed his bags, got his 17-year-old pregnant girlfriend to pack her bags. They were on their way to Havana, Cuba. The rest of them, Doc Arthur Barker and Freddie Barker, uh, as well as Ma, went to uh, northern Florida where they got a cottage. Um, and so uh, in the meantime, Carpus was in Cuba. He made it there okay. After a few weeks, um, he found out that some FBI guys from Florida had come in because they had traced that Bremer one from the kidnapping. And so immediately he left with Dolores, who uh, was his um, eight-month pregnant girlfriend at the time, and they went to visit uh, the Barkers in northern Florida. And so uh, that's exactly what they did. Next 
Unfortunately, after they left within a few weeks, on January 16, 1935, at their cottage, they were raided by the FBI. And let me tell you, that place is shot up like you would believe. It was Ma and Freddie Barker. Um, supposedly, Mom never, Ma never fired a weapon, but that place was shot up really good. And uh, uh, as you can see, they're in the morgue there, and they have willing participants, participants to pose for that fine picture there. So after this, of course, you know, it's down to Harry Campbell, and, and Alvin Kerfus are about the only two left of the gang here now. And so shortly after that, they got a tip, because Kerfus was in another end of Florida. He got a tip from his confidant in Cleveland, Ohio, and they said, you know, we, we, uh, we hear they're coming to get you next. You need to get out of there. And so he and Harry Campbell and their girlfriends fled to Atlantic City. And they got a hotel, and they weren't there a few hours when the hotel clerk had recognized their photograph because her picture was everywhere. She called the state police, and they were there. There was a big shootout that ensued. And uh, in the process, um, Harry Campbell accidentally shot Dolores, Carpus's eight-month pregnant girlfriend, in the thigh. Uh, she couldn't get down, down the stairs. And so the cops were after him. They took off and left the girls. Next. The FBI obviously caught up with Dolores. Um, she was taken to a hospital in Philadelphia, and she gave birth to her son, named him Raymond Alvin Carpus. She was then shipped off to Florida to face the, the charges of harboring two criminals. She became the first official informant. informant. That human source intelligence that we mentioned, uh, this is uh, the beginning of that. She became the first informant and she knew everything about Carpus. They had been together for three years. So she told him about his hideouts in Cleveland, uh, the prostitution house in Toledo, about his obsession with fishing. Um, she told his business history, as many contacts as she knew about. And essentially, she did receive five years in a women's prison in Michigan. Um, as well, during that same time, as I mentioned, Doc Barker had fled to Florida. The FBI caught up with him. It's a good thing that Marcus <coughs> left, and he ended up uh, spending life sentence at Alcatraz. Uh, during February and March 1935, um, they settled, Carpus and Campbell settled in in Edith Berry's, was a prostitution house in Toledo. Uh, he was very restless. Carpus was very restless. You could tell it in his autobiography, just the way the words are written. And he was just constantly thinking about the next big score. He didn't necessarily, um, in his words, do it for the money. Because even when he had money, he would constantly look at the next big score. It was always the excitement, too, for him. Uh, the money was great, but he loved the excitement as well. And so um, he said, well, I'm looking at the payroll from the Youngstown Sheet and Two plant in Warren, Ohio. And uh, I need some men to go in with me to do this uh, bur burglary. And so... Um, couldn't find anybody. Most everybody was dead or in prison. No. <laughs> and so uh, now enters Freddie Hunter. Now, Freddie is an, was an ex-gambler and convict from Warren, Ohio. He worked at the Harvard Club where Carpus worked. And uh, so they kind of formed an alliance and got together and tried to figure out how they were going to work this job. Because Freddie was from Warren, he couldn't, do the, he couldn't be in on the job. Too many people knew him. So, um, this was his second to last heist. On April 24th, 1935, uh, the, um, they took the payroll for the Youngstown Sheet and Two plant from the mail truck that had picked it up from the Warren Railroad Station, and uh, they got $72,000 in cash, $52,000 in bonds, and they split it into three shares of $20,000 each, and uh, the rest went for expenses. Uh, the one guy who was a heroin addict was so excited that he shot up as soon as he saw the money. So uh, it was a pretty exciting day for, for all of them. Next. Okay, so during this, they had successfully <coughs> pulled off this mail truck robbery in Warren. They had gotten quite a bit of cash. They were going to use that cash to fund their next score. And so during the spring of 1935, Carpus and Freddie Hunter ended up in Hot Springs, Arkansas where they made contacts with a madam named Grace Goldstein. She essentially became Carpus's girlfriend, and uh, his partner, Harry Campbell, um, took up with one of her girls, Connie Morris. 
And since they were hot in Ohio after Dolores Delaney's um, telling, spilling all the beans, he couldn't, he couldn't stay in Ohio. So um, he went to Hot Springs with Harry, and they kind of worked everything out about how they were going to flee to Hot Springs once they did this tour in Ohio. Carpus stated, I thought of the bandits of the Old West, the James brothers, the Dalton boys, and all the rest of them. They knocked over trains, and I was going to pull the same, same stunt. <coughs> he was eyeing the payrolls from the Federal Reserve Bank in Cleveland, which were going to small Ohio towns. And Carpus estimated that it carried the cash of the weekly salaries of workers in all the giant mills in Warren and in Youngstown and all the industrial centers in Ohio. And he anticipated, I'm getting th we're getting $300,000. So uh, Carpus was excited. He had this all planned, and uh, he thought, oh, the finishing touch is how am I going to escape? And so he wasn't going to escape in a car. He was going to take a plane. Okay, by June 1935, Carpus had found a pilot in Fort Clinton named George Zetzer, who ran booze from Canada during the Prohibition. And Carpus purchased a Stinson aircraft for $1,700, and they conducted dry runs back and forth to Hot Springs. They were very successful. From there, he and Grace would drive to her brother's house in Texas. Of course, the feds would never look for him there. He's never been there. In the meantime, Carpus set the train heist for Geardsville, as the train would be carrying two payrolls, and Geardsville was only a short distance from Fort Clinton. Although he also stated that the disadvantage is, it's near Hiram College. There's going to be a ton of students milling around out there. But he thought about it some more. He's like, oh, I'll pull up around it. So um, he de designated himself in the feature role as he would look after the actual heisting of the money from the payroll car. They took three machine guns, a rifle, and five pistols. And as rarely used in the past, Carpus this time decided to take dynamite some caps and peeps. If necessary, he would use the cigars in his pockets to set off the wind. Carpus thought he had planned everything perfectly. Sam Coker from Tulsa, Oklahoma, was set to stand by in Cleveland to watch the loading of the money bags onto the train from the Federal Reserve Bank in Cleveland and also count the money bags and the payroll that went into the mail car. But unfortunately, just a few days before the job, he came down with a bad case of gonorrhea, and uh, he ended up at a Toledo hospital. And so he waited out to check those bags in Cleveland. So Carpus said, well, um, I've already gone this far. I'm going to take my chances on the assumption that the payrolls are going to be on board that train is scheduled. Um, in addition to that, on that very day that he planted, November 7th, uh, was the very day that uh, Hoover had sent a flood of G-men into Cleveland looking for Carpus because they figured, oh, he's got to be pulling off a big score soon. So it was quite ironic he had, uh, he had the guts to plan this train heist when the same day FBI agents were flooding Cleveland. So they decided. It's November 7th. They're a block away from the station. Carpus is driving. He stops. He lets off John Brock, Harry Campbell, and an old gentleman in his late 50s by the name of Ben Grayson. Uh, let him off at the foot of the depot and let him walk off. And so um, Carpus and uh, Freddie Hunter drove. They drove ahead in the Plymouth. Freddie's job was to watch the parking lot, make sure nobody leaves this parking lot, walking or going by car. That's what Carpus told him. There were about 75 people milling around at the station that day. Um, and uh, Carpus, when he got out of the car, he, uh, he started walking, he looked up and he saw two telephone repairmen, and they almost were falling off the telephone poles because they were laughing hysterically. And Carpus is like, what the world's going on? And so he looks at the repairmen, then he looks at their gaze and sees that they're looking at Ben Grayson, the guy who's in his late 50s, the old time bank robber, He's dressed up in all the garb. He's got the eight-inch mustache. It's drooping down. He's got his cheeks all painted with red rouge. His shin, his eyebrows are painted, painted black, and he's got a hat on. And these repairmen are laughing so hysterically. Purpose is like, oh, my God, you're going to scare the heck out of the people. And so, um, lo and behold, they just went, you know, around like nothing was going on. 
And so the train pulled in on time. It was about 2.30 in the afternoon. The door to the, to the mail car swung open, and there were two clerks, the mail clerks, that were standing at the edge. They were looking out. And so Carpus pulls out his Tommy submachine gun, and he levels it right at them. And they just stare at him. And it looked like their eyes are going to fall out of their head. <laughs> they didn't raise their hands. They did something completely unexpected. They slammed the door and ran and hit. <laughs> okay, so what's Carpus going to do about this? He, um, he thought for a second, he said, they're hiding back there, what am I going to do? So he takes out of his pocket a stick of dynamite, and he was about to light it when he heard a car behind him in the parking lot. Carvis turned around and witnessed Freddy taking off and running after two men that looked like hobos. Meanwhile, man and woman, both terrified, were in their car trying to get away. So Carpus forgot the dynamite, ran to the parking lot, he flung open the door, he looked at the man and he said, what the hell are you doing? He takes the keys out of the ignition, he throws it as far as he can throw it, goes into the woods, he looks at Freddie, he said, I told you to watch that parking lot, nobody leaves this parking lot. And so Carpus regains his composure, heads back to the mail car. The door was still shut, obviously. He threw a stick of dynamite unlit into the car. <laughs> it landed with a thump, and he thinks it was very close to the mail clerk. And he shouts, quote, I am going to heave another stick in there, and it'll be burning. You've got five, and I'm counting now, one, two, three, by four, that door was open. <laughs> there had been three men in the back of the car, two white guys, and now a big, according to Carpus, if he sent Negro. Carpus had noticed that the black guy until he appeared at that moment. The black man stared alarmingly and stated, You can't do this, man. Get off with that gun. Carpus aimed his machine gun right over the guy's head. He pulled the trigger, expecting it to fire, but it didn't. The hammer fell down, and that sound on the gun had scared the both of them to death. All three of them, actually. They were now convinced, threw their hands up in the air, and agreed to do whatever Carpus told them. In the meantime, Grayson had lined up nearly a dozen people on the station's platform, and Carpus and the chief mail clerk moved to the back of the mail car. The payroll for Warren was there, but not the payroll for Youngstown. That was the big one. And Carpus threatened to shoot the mail clerk. Harry came by. Carpus is arguing with the mail clerk. And Harry steps into the mail cab, and Carpus says, Harry, stand back. I'm going to shoot this guy right in the head. And so the mail clerk pleaded with Carpus, stating that the Youngstown payment had been shipped out the previous day and pulled out his ledger to show Carpus. Carpus was even madder now because he knew the guy was telling the truth. <laughs> so Carpus picked out four bags of registered mail, hoping there would be some cash in the letters. The whole episode had really, this sounds like a lot, it didn't take more than a few minutes. And they made their getaway south on State Route 88 towards Ravenna. At Fort Clinton, they ripped open the mailbags to find just peanuts to Carpus's experienced eyes. In any event, Carpus accomplished what he set out to do. He had held up a train in fine style, just like the famous old Western bandits. Momentarily, he still felt pretty good. Throughout the winter of 1935 and early winter 1936, Carpus kept moving, shifting locations, keeping distance from him in the feds. Next. Since Bremer, the Bremer kidnapping of January 1934, Carpus was uh, maintaining his uh, cautiousness. He was continually moving about, accessing new connections, never accessed the same ones. And uh, Hoover admitted in his book, Persons in Hiding, I lost com complete track of Carpus. I had no idea where he was at. Uh, the FBI, though, needed to concentrate on the unscientific methods of tracking Carpus. They could find out that he committed certain crimes, but catching him was a whole other battle. How was he going to catch him? Hoover needed to find informants who could get close enough to Carpus in advance before he could escape again. In fact, Hoover himself guaranteed $5,000 to anyone who produced information that led to Carpus and Hunter's arrest. Now, the initial investigation after the train robbery 
was conducted by United States Postal Inspectors out of Youngstown. And all for obvious reasons, because they were the property of the U.S. mail. And as such, uh, they agreed to provide all of their findings and forward them to the FBI. Uh, specifically, this gentleman, agent in charge, Earl J. Conley, headed the FBI's <coughs> portion of the investigation from the Cincinnati, Ohio Bureau. And initially, Conley ignored the findings of the Youngstown Postal Inspectors, finding it hard to believe, okay, they're postal inspectors. They do mail. They don't know more than the FBI. We do the investigation work. What are they thinking? So everything that was passed along was ignored. So that further delayed and even possibly catching carpets. Um, Agent Conley only seriously entered this investigation after finding out that he, they thought Carpus was involved. Carpus's involvement in the train robbery um, was evidenced by a somewhat smudged fingerprint lifted from the windowsill of the mail train he was in. As well, he was not wearing a handkerchief or anything to hide his identity. So during the robbery, eyewitnesses were able to identify him later in a photograph. Uh, within 24 hours of the train robbery, the uh, USPIS had identified two accomplices. And um, these gentlemen, the first uh, was an ex-convict. He was the man who actually purchased the getaway car for Carpus. And he became an informant to the USPIS and essentially to the FBI. His name was Milton Lett. He was 21 years old. He was a kid who worked at the Harvard Club. And he signed for the purchase of the Plymouth sedan. That was a bad mistake. They were essentially, um, when they fled the scene, uh, the witnesses were able to get the license for it. So they, of course, reported that to the police. And they located his apartment on Huff Avenue in Cleveland and found him. Then we had Sam Coker, the informant that came down with a bad case of gonorrhea, and he went back to Tulsa after he got out of the hospital, and uh, he, uh, of course, made another grave mistake. He was bragging to his friends, as a lot of them did during that day, hey, I'm going back east, uh, don't look for me, go back east because I'm doing a train robbery, so don't call me until I get back. And so that got out to the Tulsa postal inspectors, and so... Uh, they found uh, Sam Coker, and when they did, Coker spilled the beans, told them that John Brock actually substituted for him during the train robbery. So lo and behold, they found John Brock. John Brock was also from Tulsa. And according to the FBI report of April 22, 1936, because of Sam Coker's testimony, Brock confessed to his participation in the train robbery and then named Carpus and Harry Campbell and Ben Grayson. Also, Brock told the postal inspectors about Carpus's hideout at Edith Berry's in Toledo and about the plane trip to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Clayton Hall, the last one who became the confidential informant at this stage. He was one of the men with Milton Lett who, um, who bought the Plymouth sedan. He was a steel worker from Youngstown, Ohio, and he uh, used his residence as a safe haven when Carpus and Campbell were feeling a lot of heat from the FBI, they would stay in Youngstown at Mr. Hall's place. And so by late March 1936, he was picked up by the Youngstown Postal Inspectors. Um, and ironically, that uh, January, just uh, not even two months ago, he had visited Carpus in Hot Springs, met Grace Goldstein, had no idea that Carpus was public enemy number one. They were vacationing together, you know, just thought he was a, a gambler, a petty thief, and here he read in the True Detective magazine while I was vacationing in Hot Springs. I uh, saw Carcass's photograph in two or three pages, like, oh my God. So he went back to Youngstown, and he just didn't have any more contact. No more contact for Carcass until uh, March when the USPIS picked him up. And so at that point, the FBI got involved. And... Um, so uh, Mr. Hall agreed to help them try and locate Carpus in order to avoid prosecution. Um, essentially, he gave the FBI location of Carpus's rental home in Hot Springs and the name of his new girlfriend, Grace Goldstein. And working with the FBI special agent in charge, Earl Conley, Clayton Hall agreed to contact Grace Goldstein, believing she would essentially, not knowing that he knew, would divulge Carpus's location. 
When sent to visit Goldstein, she revealed that Corpus and Hunter were in New Orleans now, but that she but she claimed that she didn't know exactly where they were staying. So Agent Conley arrived in New Orleans on April 27th to endure, interrogate Grace Goldstein, but she wouldn't budge. Agent Conley located her family in Texas and harassed them into convincing Grace to give up what she knew to avoid prosecution. On April 29th, and after coaxing from her family and interrogation from the FBI, Grace Goldstein agreed to provide Carpus's address, she is the last confidential informant, to Agent Conley, and only if the FBI promised not to prosecute anyone in her family, and he agreed to it. As it turned out, when he met with her, she in fact didn't even know where Carpus was staying, but she did know where Freddie, Freddie Hunter was staying, and he was staying in an apartment on Canal Street in New Orleans. She indicated that Carpus came back and forth there, usually to eat his meals, and that he could catch him at some point during the day. Next. Okay, this is actually the, um, the sketch that the FBI agents made up the night, uh, actually, yeah, the night before, because they, um, they put surveillance out on, um, on the 30th and then on the 1st. And so here you can see this is Jefferson Davis Parkway here. And if you can read closely, you see that EJC, Earl J. Conley, Brantley, and some of the other agents' names, they were in a car behind some trees here. The cross street here, which is Canal, right here, supposedly, you don't see Hoover's name on there, do you? That's kind of odd. Uh, Tolson and uh, three other agents, right? And so here's the apartment building. This whole area here, they had the whole place surveillance by agents and bushes on the second and third floors. And so, um, so yeah, they pretty much got the place surrounded at this point. And so Hoover arrives in New Orleans on the evening of April 30th. That same day, FBI agents put the apartment building in area, as I mentioned, under surveillance. The agents sketched this diagram. And according to FBI records on May 1st, agent in charge of Conley and his four men were parked on the opposite corner, which I located there for Jefferson Davis Parkway. And then Canal Street um, was followed by a car occupied by Hoover, um, Tolson, Buchanan, and Agent Dwight Brantley. Next. Here is a great shot of the apartment. And so unexpectedly, they came out uh, this door here. And instead of accessing Jefferson Davis Parkway, where Earl Conley's car was, they came out the back door and straight to Canal Street, where their Plymouth Coops parked in front. Next. And this is their Plymouth Coop. Pretty cool. <clears throat> Next. So, after returning from a trip to Mississippi to look at a, a big score that Carpus was eyeballing, um, he headed over to Freddie's apartment on Jefferson Parkway, and he planned to take his car to a garage for servicing. Um, but first, Carpus uh, transferred all the guns. He had a, a whole uh, bunch of guns in his trunk. He wanted to transpose those, of course, from his car to Freddie's car, and they did that near uh, Lake Pontchartrain. Um, Carpus kept his 45 with him, and then they drove to the garage in New Orleans where they left Carpus's car. Uh, now, Carpus needed to get his car by 5 p.m., and he asked Freddie to drive down with him. So, with the heat, because it was, um, I believe they said it was 87 degrees in New Orleans on May 1st that day, um, he didn't want to take his jacket, so his jacket had his 45 in it, and so instead of taking his jacket with the 45, he stuffed it under the couch cushion. And he and Freddie walked out onto the sidewalk. Carpus uh, and Hunter got into the Plymouth. Just as Carpus was about to turn the key in the ignition, a car, as I mentioned, cut sharply in front of his car. That would be Earl J. Conley coming up uh, Jefferson Davis Parkway. Cut and blocked the front of Carpus's car. And then, according to FBI records, uh, simultaneously, Hoover and his men um, drove up from Canal Street, the cross street, and blocked their car to the rear of Carpus's. With their guns, Hoover and his men covered Carpus at the exact same time that Agent Hurt and Conley did. 
A voice at his window told him to keep his hands on the steering wheel, although the FBI records do not indicate it. Um, many accounts say that Hoover pulled Carpus out of the driver's seat as Carpus was reaching for a weapon in the back seat, although Carpus, as you can see by that picture, stated, I had a coupe, I didn't have a back seat. Um, but the FBI reports state that Carpus did have various weapons in his automobile. Now, when I talked to retired agent uh, Larry Webb, he indicated there indeed is a bench seat behind there. You can kind of see that with a small window, and that's where he had stacked his guns. And he said there were indeed guns back there. He doesn't know for certain, but he said uh, quite possibly the, the, the myth is, is that he reached back, back there to grab one of the guns. But in the end, without firing a shot, Carpus and Hunter were captured. According to the FBI records, Hoover told his agents, well, guys, we got him, put the cuffs on him. And the agents looked at one another, and there were 28 agents, mind you, and now one had thought to bring handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason they didn't bring handcuffs is because Carper said, I'll never be taken alive. They'll have to take me like John Dillinger or Pretty Boy Floyd. And so, of course, they expected to drive up there at Jefferson Davis <coughs> Parkway at the apartment and have a shootout. So the cool guy with the machine gun, Buck Buchanan, agent, one of Hoover's favorites, he looks at uh, Clarence Hurt, the guy, the agent next to him, and so he's like, here, Hurt, chief, this is all we got. <laughs> and so it went down in history that uh, Hoover's first arrest was secured by a yellow necktie, possibly silk. <laughs> Next. Okay, this is a photograph of the guns that they found inside Freddy's apartment. Um, and as you can, you can see, there's quite a very um, different set of weapons. And so uh, they were armed pretty good, sure, should they should have ensue. Now, as you may have heard, there has been much debate about whether Hoover actually made Carpus's first arrest, or made Carpus ask his first arrest. But what does Carpus say about his arrest by Hoover? Let's take a look.
life, but he wasn't scared of the misunderstanding. He didn't feel the dark light right yeah, now. Well, yeah, he couldn't hold it. He couldn't hold it still. So I asked the man in front of me with the machine gun. He seemed to be the coolest in the lot. I said, who's the boss of this outfit anyway? And he said, oh, he'll be here for the boy. And I said, well, I wanted to tell that guy to, uh, with the rifle back at me to get it out of my back because uh, he's so nervous, I think he's going to shoot right through me and right through you. He does shoot. Uh, and this got the guy a little upset. He heard me say that. He said, well, you son of a bitch. When we get you to the office, I'm going to show you who your boss is. And I turned my head like this to answer him. And as I did, up at the corner of the apartment building, this was on the corner, I see a guy peeping around the corner. And I go, what the hell is this? And I, uh, when I stopped talking, these other agents that were right close to me, uh, they started looking to see what I was looking at. Why? I quit talking. And finally, here came another one. Around the corner, looking around the corner, one of the agents shouted, We got him, Chief! We got him! Come on, come on, everything's all right, we got him. <laughs> so here they came, it turned out to be the gold dust twins that they were going in those days. Uh, <laughs> so, despite what you believe, whether you believe Carpus or you believe Puma, when the FBI closed the case on the Carpus uh, Barker gang, known to have terrorized, they terrorized the Midwest for five years. Carpus was linked to at least, actually, 14 murders, two kidnappings, innumerable bank robberies, and cash in excess of $3 million. Talk about bank robberies. A typical bank job brought these guys individually more money than an average American earned in five years. The Carpus Barker Gang's one bank robbery, the one I mentioned, for $266,000, brought more than the James brothers made in a lifetime. Ironically, Carpus was right. He did make Hoover's reputation as a fearless lawman. Because of this small town tra train robbery here in Garrettsville, keep in mind there are many significant <coughs> outcomes. It was Hoover's first arrest, the last great train heist in American history, the first train robbery to use a plane for a getaway, led to Hoover's advancement in human source intelligence. It was the capture of the Depression era's last public enemy number one, and Carpus eventually set a record for spending more time at Alcatraz than any other inmate in history. Next. And this is his uh, criminal record here. When he was paroled um, in 1969, he actually uh, was not a naturalized citizen, and so he went to back to Montreal, Canada. Um, and then uh, there, while there in Canada, he actually worked with a um, staff writer at the Weekender magazine to write his first book, which was uh, published in 1971. It's called the Alvin Carpus Story. He also did another book, which he didn't live to see its culmination, a book done um, just after, after his death in 1979, he died at the age of 72. He lived in Spain at the time, and at first they declared it a suicide because there were sleeping pills near his bed, um, but later they declared that he died of natural causes. And uh, the uh, writer that um, I actually looked at a lot of his material thinks that it may have been his last girlfriend who was an addict and alcoholic, and he was mixing the two and uh, accidentally overdosed. So they never did an autopsy. Nobody knows for certain what happened. But um, in 1979, at the age of 72, Carpus died. Now, I want you guys to take a look behind you. See that uh, G-Man on the wall? <laughs> Throughout the decades, this uh, local event of the train robbery has been adopted as the backstory of our mascot here at James A. Garfield School District, uh, my own alma mater. According to a recent editorial put out by our high school's paper here, The High Crier, many have traced the mascot's origin to this infamous train robbery uh, conducted by Alvin Creepy Carcass and his five bandits. 
As a result, FBI agents known as government men or G-men were sent to the Garrettsville area to search for Parvis and his accomplices. As referenced by Dr. James Pesachek, as I mentioned, a 1950s alum of Garfield High School, he's also been a lifelong resident here, he's always understood that the fighting G-men mascot characterized by an inspector represented the government men who flooded the area following the 1935 train breaks. This is still very much an unanswered question, which I, I can't tell you today. But uh, my research is going uh, on with this, and uh, I think I'm getting closer and closer to finding a definitive answer. I know that's a big deal. People would certainly like that to be true, and I certainly would like that to be true as well. And I'm going to try and find that answer for you in the next month or so. <coughs> Meanwhile, since the 1930s, many of these battle sites, such as the Gearsville Train Depot, during the war on crime remain as they did with a few truck trailers. Um, they're out of the way spots, now dusty and cobwebbed, of interest only to the middle-aged crime buff, and it's gone, but not forgotten. This site in Garrisville still remains a country road, and it needs an historical marker. In the middle of thick grass, tall hemlocks and meandering trails dominate this right away between Manaway and Garrettsville. Today, this former location of the Cleveland Railway, winding its way through the edge of the Garrettsville town limits, serves only to remind us now of the quaint historic settlement which originally grew up around the town's gristmill and maple syrup center. You hear no echo of machine gun fire, no ghostly screams of terrified victims, no reminder of Alvin Creepy Carpus's Wild West Venture, which led J. Edgar Hoover and his G-men on the chase of their careers. So in the end, why does this matter? Well, I say to you fine folks tonight, this is a call to action. And it's a call to action not only to support an historical marker at the site, but to recognize that this research really illuminates the lack of attention given to communities and to local history. Yet this research demonstrates how a revived interest in our local history and an increased emphasis on teaching its courses can lead to its inclusion in the American History School curriculum. This historical research speculates that an interest in local history influences the learning of national and world history as it provides a familiar background for understanding our larger society. And understanding our larger society, especially during this age of globalization, creates an interconnectedness among people from all walks of life who first need to feel that they are part of their local communities. Indeed, this last successful train heist in our American history, taking place in my hometown and probably yours, has left an indelible mark on our communities. More importantly, I want to close with this thought, and Sarah, if I can come up. Now, Sarah is the best reason that we can hope for. She is the next generation, and she is a good example of why an interest in local history can encourage young people to build skills, acquire passions, come to understandings about people and responsibilities in their changing world as they grow, learn, and develop. Young people are most likely to develop these strengths and utilize them out in the world when they feel grounded, when they feel informed, and when they're engaged at their home base. It is important for all young people to know their local history because it lets them know who they were, where they were at, and how they got there. A wise man once told me, quote, an interest in our local history can give us a fuller understanding of ourselves and of our common humanity so that we can better face the future in the bigger world. Thank you very much.
His son actually, uh, Raymond Alvin, became a petty thief, and he died when he was in the when he was in his sixties. He had a son, but I wasn't able to trace him down. There's no information that I can find on him. Did he stay in Ohio all the time? Uh, no, I think I believe that. Well, he was essentially raised by Carpus's parents, and they lived in Chicago. Oh. Okay. They had moved from uh, Topeka, Kansas, to Chicago. And so they raised him, and I think inevitably he went back there. They also went to Lois, my great-grandpa. Oh, okay. Yeah, because did you know that uh, Bonnie and Clyde were the in Was they what? No, I missed that yeah. whole fact. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, we pulled it. They brought that car off, shot up, and took his garage. That's how he knew. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Did the... Uh, when he cut the room, his fingers did it work? No, uh, as I mentioned, they, the FBI picked up his fingerprints in the mail car in Garrettsville. It was a little bit smudged, but it's still, unless you cut down to the bone, it is almost impossible to get rid of the fingerprints. All for nothing. All for nothing. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Marcus is very insane. He is very insane. That yeah, I could not tell you. Well, see, see, they in the 30s is when they uh, uh, developed the dead office in Francisco Bay because so many uh, gangsters were escaping from prison and they couldn't contain them. So that was actually built in the 30s. So it's quite possible he was number 325. Yes, exactly. It was in the 30s. Yes, correct. Uh, she remarried and nobody was able to find her. Paul McAbee, the historian in St. Paul, was never able to track her down. Uh, any other questions? Thank you folks very much. Thank you so much.